Welcome back. In a moment, we'll be looking into the world of wearables to keep you fit. First, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. UN investigators are looking into the alleged torture and murder of government opponents in Burundi. They've drawn up a list of suspects they believe should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity. The UN has verified 564 executions in the Central African nation since April 2015, when President Pierre Unke Unziza sparked protests by saying he would seek a third term. The Burundi government called the report by the UN independent investigators biased and politically motivated, and he's denied and refuted all of its allegations. Police have arrested five people suspected of forming a Daesh cell in Spain, Belgium and Germany. Three of them were detained in Spain, two of them in Barcelona, and one in Spain's North African enclave, Melilla. The group is thought to have used social media to glorify Daesh, and they are accused of radicalization and of commissioning attacks. And a new report by the International Union of Conservation of Nature points at the tumbling population of elephants. The report, which was released at a UN conference on the global wildlife trade, states that Africa's elephant population has fallen by nearly 20% between 2006 and 2015. The surge, the authors say, is due to an increase in ivory poaching in the continent, driven by rising demand in Asia. Next, do you want to be fit and healthy? A low-calorie diet and an exercise program is the tried and trusted way to lose weight for most of us. But it's not easy, so how about a shiny new gadget to track your fitness goals? The global wearables market is expected to reach a value of 19 billion US dollars by 2018. Thing is, are they really worth it? For Insight, Chloe Culpan reports. More than 10.5 million people in the UK consider themselves to be runners, and most use some sort of tracking device, capturing each stride from the Saturday morning jog to the gentle stroll in the park. But what impact does all this data have on us? London-based personal trainer and nutritionist Lindsay Holden says she's had clients who've become more concerned with the data than the results. Some people like to log everything and they find it really useful to see everything that they're doing, but for some people that can be a bit dangerous and lead to quite obsessive behaviour. So it's a lot of data uh, that a lot of people just don't understand enough to be able to use. The University of Pittsburgh studied 471 people aged 18 to 35 whose BMI classes them as overweight over two years. Everyone was given a low-calorie diet, counselling and a training programme, and half of the participants used wearable technology, like a smartwatch. Unsurprisingly, the researchers found everyone who exercised and followed the plan lost weight, but what shocked them was that those with the trackers lost around 2.4 kilograms less in the long term. Things like running watches were great because that sort of monitors your speed and so you can track your distance, you can track your speed and that's a really good thing if you know you're a racer or running marathons and things like that. But when it comes down to then tracking everything that you're putting into your mouth, every movement that you're taking, it's great for people that work in an office because it gets you sort of monitoring your steps but when it's coming to the food you can just overcompensate. A study by the University of Wisconsin-Madison found that their female participants were more likely to exercise wearing a wristband tracker because they liked the style of it. But when it comes to weight loss, it's clear we need to remember that whatever the tracker says, it isn't responsible for our tea break treats. Chloe Culpin reporting for Insight. To discuss that further, I'm joined by the performance consultant Andy Barton from The Sporting Mind. And also joining us from the University of Pittsburgh on Skype is John Jakasik, who's the Professor and Chair of the Department of Health and Physical Activity. Andy, these things, are they a replacement for determination to be fitter? I think people think they are. Um, the, the problem with them, it's a bit like uh, having a Sergeant Major on your side. You, you kind of start resenting them after a while. Um, uh, and it, it, it kind of makes you a bit passive. I think that's one of the problems with them. So um, you really need to have an internal kind of motivation to achieve goals like, uh, you know, certain amounts of weight loss, for instance. So... Um, makes you passive. That's interesting, because they're supposed yeah. to make you active, aren't they? Yeah, but if you think about it, you're being told what to do. So it's an external um, kind of motivation. You're, you're, 
you're being dictated to by the, the watch. I think they're becoming more sophisticated, and I think they need to become a bit more sophisticated to kind of work with the mentality of you know, people who have a goal in mind. But, um, and, there, and there certainly is a place for them. But uh, I, I mean, these sort of things, and there's just a couple of examples yeah. here. This happens to be one of the Garwin ones. Uh, for athletes who are good at their sport and want to improve, mm. they're very useful, aren't they? They'll monitor heart rate, they'll tell you lap times and all yeah. the sophisticated data that you might want to see, am I on a general improvement track? But for somebody who just wants to remind themselves, you know, to yeah. take the stairs or to walk well, a bit, a bit further like, or whatever, um, do, do they serve a purpose there? It's a bit like the alarm clock. You know, you have the option to switch the snooze button if, if it doesn't work. So. Um, you, you have to really buy into it. If, you, if you're highly motivated, uh, you know, you're highly determined and you've got a really strong internal motivation to, to achieve that goal, then it can be a really good support for it. Might be. Okay. John Jacasic, let me bring you in here. Do you think these things have a use or are they a bit cosmetic, really? Actually, I think they have a, a great use. I think uh, the challenge is how do we make them do what they're intended to do? I, I agree with your other guests that you know sometimes these things uh, take the attention off of the things that are really important, especially when it comes to the broad scope of lifestyle behaviors. Um, and you know, you look down at this thing and it's telling you, it, it's supposed to tell you like this is what you've done and it should motivate you to do more. Uh, however, some individuals in our study looked down and saw how little that they were doing, and that actually demotivated them in some ways. It was <laughs> discouraging. So, yeah. so I, I, these technologies form a great platform uh, on, upon which we can build, but we need, we need to do more. These, these things have the capacity to do more, and because they are so passive, I think that these are a little bit problematic for some folks. Uh, they're very good at calorie counting, aren't they, or giving you an impression of how many calories you may have spent. But often, when we do the mathematics, people forget you would spend a certain number of calories just living or sitting in an armchair or getting up and going and make another cup of coffee. So you need to take those away first, don't you, before you gloat about your achievements. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, you, I'm sitting here now, you're sitting there, and, and we're burning calories as we, as we just sit here. And I think the, the challenge is you look down at these things and they either tell you the calories or tell you the steps. And, you get a little bit of a false sense of security that, oh, look how active I was today. Um, I'll have another whatever. And uh, it's, not, it's not quite that easy. You, you need to pay attention to that part of your lifestyle in order to manage your weight. And I think that this actually detracts from that. And the ones that are quite sophisticated, I mean, we showed that one of the jawbone um, devices, which isn't, hasn't got a screen. So there's no sort of visual nagging going on there. You have to go to the bother of downloading the data and reading it on a on another device, typically a phone maybe. Are they less useful than the ones who've actually got screens or maybe the, the, the fitness watches? Well, you know, the idea is, is that this immediate feedback should make, should make a difference. I think the more immediate the feedback uh, you get it, the, the better it's going to be. And the technology is at the point where we should be able to look down and see in, in real time what's going on. But sometimes that real time feedback, again, you, you almost become like, oh, I got another 10 steps, oh, I got another five mm -hmm. steps. But you know, the reality is, is um, if you walk a mile, which is 2,000 to 2,500 steps, that's only an additional 100 calories. It's not like you can go out and eat a large, large meal because you walked an extra you know, mile today. So I think that's a little bit of a false sense of security for people. Andy, that is a problem, isn't it? So, you know, this watch or another one tells me, hey, you've just done 100% more than you said your target number of steps was, so yeah. people might go out and have a hamburger for a meal. That's yeah. a little more than yeah. overcompensate for the good thing. Yes, yeah. it? it's like you're buying an extra reward and the reward is food, and that's probably the last <laughs> thing you want to be having. You, know, you want to be rewarding yourself with uh, something that's not food related probably, but um, it, yeah, it can, it can give you a full sense of security. That, that can be the issue. With and like gym membership, the fact you've spent money on it, that can sort of give you a full sense of security. I've invested all this money, yeah. therefore I am going to get fit. Yeah. But without doing the work, you don't. Exactly, and, and that's why most gym members go in January and stop going by March. So, it's uh, the essential business plan for most gyms. Exactly, it, yes. All yeah. those sleepers. Yeah. Um, is it human determination then, either through your own um, decision-making, or would you say actually some kind of weight loss program or getting fit or some kind of sporting attainment always works better with a 
human to guide you, a, a fitness um, trainer of some kind? It can be helpful, and, and it depends who you're working with. You really want someone who's very much in the same boat with you, but then you, the problem is if someone drops out, then you're likely to drop out at the same time. So, so it does help to have teams around you, but it, in terms of the, the desire, the desire has to be totally yours, and then the support will help. So things like the, the watches will help, the external support will help. But you've got to come to that determination. But it's got to be yours. Yeah, we, we can't be looking for excuses. We, it's, it's like we, we need a mission, you know, we need a mission, something that makes us determined enough to, to go for it. But John, you can have a virtual team, can't you? Once you're in one of these communities and you've signed up to one of the support networks, um, you can compete, if you like, amongst friends to get fitter. Does, does that nature of the, of the service help? I think for people that, you know, like having people around them, like the competition, uh, that can help them a lot. I and mean, some of the other work that we've done has suggested, though, that those competitions need to kind of change every 8 to 12 weeks. You need to kind of change it up because people start to lose interest. And, you know, people start losing interest even in the wearables after about three to six months. So kind of keeping it fresh and kind of keeping it different would be very, very helpful. And, you know, your, your other your guest said um, about, you know, the, the other person. Uh, you know, well, one of the challenges with these activity trackers is is that they're tr they don't really simulate a person. Um, and, you know, it, it, they tell you what to do, but they never ask you why you didn't do what you needed to do. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. So I think we need to figure out how to use the technology to really help people overcome the barriers that they face and not just tell them to do things. Okay, so you need to be able to encourage. But if you had, a, you know, a Siri-like voice breathing soothing words into your ear to say, do you really want to eat that sandwich, Dave? Um, that would put people off as well, wouldn't it? it? It sure would. And I think that, you know, what, where we are right now is it's a one-size-fits-all kind of um, technology. And everybody responds differently. And so I think as the technology advances, we're going to be able to, you know, pick and choose. This part of the technology works well for these types of individuals. This other part of the technology works well for these, these other types of individuals. So it's almost becoming, becoming like precision intervention, precision medicine, where we're going to be able to get to that point at some point down the road. Good stuff. John Jukasik, thank you. Andy Martin here in the studio, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go all the way over here here so you can track my fitness as we tell you about the Insight Bike today, a little something which we feel you should know. How do you fancy a little trip to Mars? The spacecraft manufacturer SpaceX has given us an insight into their interplanetary rocket and the capsule it's currently developing to transport large numbers of people and cargo to Earth's closest neighbour. The founder, Elon Musk, says he hopes to colonise the Red Planet and he envisions humans living on it in a large colony. Capable of carrying 100 passengers plus cargo per voyage, I guess he might be on his way to doing so. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Inside.